I, I never met him personally, but I went to Zimbabwe in uh, 2006 and spent six months touring the country. And I met a lovely priest uh, named Father John Dove uh, while I was in Harare, who, um, who had written his biography, uh, the first biography called Strange Vagabond of God. And uh, he, uh, he took me to the settlement, the Le Mutemwa leprosy settlement, where John had worked for about 10 or 12 years uh, serving the lepers there. And uh, I just uh, stayed for about six weeks uh, with the, the, the residents and with the staff there. It made an impression on you. Deep impression, yes, yes. Even now today. Absolutely. It was 18 years ago, but it uh, seemed like it really seems like yesterday that I was there. Um, I spent, I climbed that mountain, Chig Chigona Mountain, about probably at least five days a week and uh, spent time in prayer up there where the little big, there's a little pool there. It collects water when it rains and he bathed in that pool uh, when he was forced to, to live up at the top of that mountain. But um, he was a, just an amazing free spirit. He had a great desire to, to commune with God in prayer and to help other people to have joy and to feel God's peace in their life. And the antithesis of the kind of modern man and modernity is kind of, if you were alive now, it'd be almost kind of heroic in proportion. Well, you know, his, his life would speak volumes to people who are searching and have no real sense of meaning in their life. Because he found joy in God in, in, in every, really every aspect of life, creation, in, the, in, the, uh, in music, in, in the poor and the, the downtrodden, the suffering peoples, he, he could easily identify with their pain because he had gone deep into, into his own heart to seek to find God there. And the man is happier for it. Yes, absolutely. He, he, he didn't, and you know, he had worked, he'd been a military man. He had fought in the, uh, with the Gurkhas in the Burma, Burmese War. And that's where he met this priest, Father Dove, who helped to bring him into full communion with the Catholic Church. But, um, he, um, he just was a man who, uh, who exuded uh, the, the, the beauty of, of God in, in his words and in his poems and his songs. He, uh, he, loved to, he loved to sing and he loved to help other people to pray and, and find peace. Yeah. Do you think we'll be saying St. John? Most, most definitely. His life is, uh, is, is a, it's a, it's an example for all of us that uh, sanctity is possible. Uh, and if we pray, and do our best to use the gifts we have, God will, will use us to, to touch a lot of people. Uh, I've worked with John in 1965, in Silvera House. I was a teacher, teaching ladies in Zimbabwe how to run their women's club. I worked with her with the brother Dove and Penny Green, and a lady called Elizabeth. So we used to go around with John, and we used to go in the mountains in Chishawasha. And when he was coming, I was only 21 and my friend was also 20. When he used to come for lunch now, we used to say, oh, you Jesus, oh, why, why are you late for lunch? He said, Basilia, and said, why do you call me Jesus? I said, your picture, you know, your features. The feature like, you know, the picture which we used to see about Jesus, they looked like John. So we said, you know, each time we, we look at you, we see Jesus in you. You are too holy. He said, don't do that. You know, he was a quiet man. So when I went, uh, when I came back, we didn't come, we didn't see him again. Then when we heard about the, his death and the miracle which happened, I, I phoned my, my friend, she was in Sweden. She had gone to work in Sweden. I said, Elizabeth, you remember us? telling you that John looks like Jesus. He used to be holy. So I've taught all my relatives, my friends in Zimbabwe, we follow John Bradburn. Through him, he's helping us a lot. My children, when she came here to work here like a nurse, she trained here, she couldn't find a job. She said, Mommy, I was looking through the window. I saw an eagle. I said, that's John. My other me myself when i wanted to come here we seek the asylum here i went to St. cathedral in harare i wrote a letter a petition i put it in the hands of of uh, mary you know it's like this i put my petition in her arms then i said john let me follow my children 
you know, this country is no good. I want to go to England. 2001, I was at my house in Waterfalls. A swarm of bees, they come and they come back at my house. I asked the people to come and remove me. My mother said, no, they'll go away. It's John. You know, each time, even now when I arrived here, I've, I've got a friend who brought us from Plymouth. I was opening the window. A bee came in. You know, John, I believe in him. He's helping us a lot, especially my family. I traveled from Birmingham to here. A friend has come to pick me up at Plymouth. They slept here, so we are going back tomorrow. John, he's a wonderful. I didn't know that John and Dove, they grew up here. I didn't know. I just thought they were just a missionary, you know, like John and the Dove in Silvera. So when I saw the Dove on the screen, I said, oh, that's Father Dove <laughs> from Silvera. So he is we'll follow him, and one day he'll be a saint, I know. Oh, I, hope, I hope such a lot, and <laughs> in fact, I'm already praying. <laughs> and uh, I woke also for uh, inside the historical commission uh, to uh, prepare for the beatification. And uh, John Alinez, you know, once he said, he was quite young when he said, uh, I would like to go to paradise, paradise directly because he said, people see that a man uh, so skilled in fiasco than me is able to go to paradise. It will give great hope for a lot. <laughs> and that's very typical of, of John. But, uh, uh, when I think on John, there are two or three sentences which already came, you know. I, I, I know him for 40 years now, and I work on him for 20 years, so nearly every day I pray or think <laughs> on him. Uh, the first one was a sister, he, uh, he, he was with uh, when he was also quite young. He said, John, this thing very special in him that what he seemed to be, he was. It's so, so rare among us, you have always a lot of things. <laughs> but no, he, he was what he seemed to be. And the second one was uh, from uh, a Jesuit father who knew well John in Africa and say, uh, John was a person for whom the only real thing was the heaven, was God. That's it. And John itself wrote quite soon after he, he, he went to, to Jesus and uh, even years before his conversion to the Catholic Church, he says that I discovered that looking for God was the only thing I wanted to do. And uh, after he repeated it, and, and it's, it, it's the life of John, and I think it's, it is only nice. A man who searched God and having found him, wanted others to find him. The last thing I would like to say for John is that all his life was a battle between two Johns. One wanted to be hermit or say a life alone for the alone, a life for God. So he, he, every time people were coming to see him when he was praying, he, he was very welcoming, but in himself, in, in once, only once, but he was in Mutanua. His friend uh, Gips came and John was a little furious. He said, well, I told you not to come on Tuesday because Tuesday he was hermit day and you came on Tuesday. <laughs> so, so, to be alone for the alone. And the other one, he was unable not to help people who needed help, especially those who must need. We see that in Buckfast. In Buckfast, he, he looked after uh, young handicapped people and all this. And in fact, John, for 30 years, he looked how to join the two, and he found in, in Mutenwa. All the day, he was with the lepers from helping them in all ways that what is known. He was really. He was praying also, but he was for the lepers and sometimes also for the night when they were dying or suffering. And the night was for God. He wrote his poem prior or prior poems, I don't know, but all the night was for God. Don't ask when he slept. That's the only question. And he has found the equilibrium because the two Jones, the hermit and the man helping his brother and poor brother. It's quite. Uh... It's not often you meet a guy who's what might be perceived as a bit of a joker, you know, always smiling, always laughing, always singing, yeah. but also super serious about his prayer. Oh, yes. We normally do not see that yeah. personality in one person, those kind of uh, yeah. characteristics in one person. Yeah, it, had them. 
Yeah, uh, John has the, the quality of uh, mocking himself a lot. So uh, I think it was a, a, a kind of uh, something strong in him uh, uh, that is the secret of the life we've got. And uh, for example, when not far from here, Buckfast, when during uh, winter he, he climbed uh, highly wheels, he's in the highest mountains here, <laughs> and uh, he wanted to do uh, like the prophet Elijah, uh, just to pray and uh, praying that a raven may come to give him some bread, you know, <laughs> and it lasts a few days <laughs> and he returned. Uh, but in fact, he returned to live in, in a little barrack, which about as cold as was <laughs> on top of, of the high wheels. And uh, it's and he wrote that about himself, what I, I say about when he, he, he sang a uh, uh, Lamentation, he was able to do so much serious in, in the singing, uh, he repeated for months and months, and he was very glad when an uh, old Jewish man asked him to, to sing it again. <laughs> uh, but at the same time, he said, well, God has other plans, uh, and John's plans are not the good ones. <laughs> that, that's all. He, he, and he, he left uh, the, the, the following days, you know, he was able to go to Holy Land to, to pray in front of the uh, wailing wall. And uh, what does it work? I returned, and he returned with uh, a boat full of uh, sheep and uh, in the middle of sheep. That, that, that's pure John uh, story. But he, he was a very serious man, in fact. Just uh, uh, it was uh, joy is a part of the of the man, man of God, serious man. I mean, and he shows it to us. Of, uh, John Bradbury Memorial Society, and also part of friends of. Uh, 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 friends of Mutema. And what's the charity called? Oh, the charity called Friends of Mutema. And you're picking up the baton, picking up the legacy of what John did and continuing it? Yes, in a small way. Because uh, I fundraise for the needs of uh, residents at Mutema. And what does that work involve? It involves uh, contacting people, mobilizing resources, buying things that are needed at Mutema. For example, crutches, wheelchairs, providing medica medication, and also ensuring that uh, the care of the residents is up to standard, like uh, if their voice. They are not able to articulate what their needs are, but I'm able to stand in the gap and speak on their behalf to ensure that they are well looked after and their rights as uh, individuals are respected, and that also they get uh, the spiritual care that they, 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 that they need. John was both concerned about the physical needs, but uh, it seemed primarily he wanted to talk to the person, make sure they weren't lonely, make sure they had friendship, those kind of things, those kind of qualities. Yes, this is why we are friends of Mutema. So each time we go to Mutema, we take time to sit with the residents and keep patients. We talk to them, what are their needs, and we befriend them. And we also need to know how they feel being in, at Mutema. We provide for their needs as they tell us. For example, at the moment I'm looking for televisions for all of them. I'm looking for to replace beds that are no longer comfortable. I'm also looking for, uh, for entertainment for them. There are a few patients who are blind who need uh, just a small radio so that you know they don't feel lonely. So these are some of the things that we do. Uh, as friends of Mutema, we also take care of their needs like birthdays, Christmas party, Easter party. We normally do most of the cooking from our, our houses. We bring the food to Mutema, we share. Uh, the last event that we did was a uh, Leprous Day uh, celebrations, uh, where we brought you know, entertainment for the, for, for the residents. There was a band, there was music, there was time to interact with them, and there was time to be to, to, to be seen as part and parcel of that big family. And is John's legacy, is it known only to the people that run the charity or is he known all over Zimbabwe? It is known all over Zimbabwe because besides the charity uh, or the centre where patients and residents are, there is also the shrine. People come to the shrine of John Bradburn uh, because uh, 
they've experienced miracles happening in their lives, situations changing. Those people were not able to forgive, being filled with the love of God, and now being able to go home and move with their own lives. After bereavement, when people visit John Bradburn, they are comforted and their circumstances are changed. So there are many miracles that take place when people come. Many young people from schools, before they write the exams, they normally come to spend the time at the shrine and on Mount Chigona, praying and praising God. And when they go, for some reason, they do very well in school. There are people who came to Mtema uh, with the problem fruit of the womb. And after visiting Mtema, they, you know, they go back home and they found themselves with children. There are people who came with the, they were in need maybe of the, um, inter intervention. Uh, they wanted maybe a visa to go abroad. And after visiting Mutema, they get their miracle. I in particular got my own miracle 23 years ago when I was at my experience in menopausal symptoms. I'd been put on a woman replacement therapy for six months. And then I said to myself, how long am I going to be on this thing? So I said, no, I'm going to Mutema, went in the shrine, went up, say, uh, up the mountain to go to Gono. And when I came back, all the symptoms disappeared. All my, so there are so many people come, uh, but when you come for, to, to, for, to, to the shrine, there's no way you cannot go and see the patients, because it is the patients who are the focus, that you know, somebody has to get leprosy for us to get our, our miracles and our breakthroughs. So it's such a special place uh, of worship. And also when we celebrate uh, John Bradburn's anniversary, this year we're going to the 40th, 44th anniversary of John Bradburn. Uh, thousands and thousands of people come all over the place. We spend the night praising the Lord, attending Mass. There's an opportunity for confessions because there will be so many priests around and people are reconciled back to God. But besides that, you can never leave Mutema without your miracle because uh, John Bradburn has been performing miracles for us and we love him. We can't wait for him to be beatified so that we can enjoy our first saint in Zimbabwe. Now we are on the first part of the process, diocesan part in Arare. And um, we, we have some uh, witnesses that, uh, some witnesses that uh, the judge uh, have um, to, inter to interview. And uh, I hope that uh, 2024, the diocesan uh, court, the diocesan process, uh, um, finish, finish, will be finished. So in our lifetime? No. Yes, but uh, uh, for me it's uh, uh, not, not uh, a long time because uh, the cause uh, started in uh, 2019. So six years? It's not a long time. It's not a long time. And what was the miracle? Tell me briefly about the miracle. Well, huh? Yeah, yeah. One miracle to declare John blessed, and another miracle to declare saint. What were they? Oh, it's one happened. It's one no, happened. no, no, no. Oh, no. no. So many graces. Yeah, many graces. But for the people, Zimbabwean people, uh, John is a saint. But uh, the church, the Catholic Church, more it's more, yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Sorry, yeah. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, um, I, I'm very happy because I, I, I know that uh, there is a, a, a sainthood of John um, in uh, in uh, Zimbabwe, but also in England, also in England. He's a unique uh, guy in so far as. Not many people. Not, not many people uh, are so popular with the Africans and so popular with the Europeans. No, 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 no. no. Well, the the, the, the saints are popular. So the man or the woman in the in the country, for example, in Italy. Okay, but John, John, is a a man that. Uh, 
connect Zimbabwe and England. And this is important for many, many reasons. Do you remember the story of Zimbabwe, Rhodesia, England? And now John is a man that um, take, take Porta, bring peace in these two nations. This is a, a, another, another uh, motive, reason of his sainthood. He, well, he spent years wandering, on, on his own, wandering around, trying to work out where his place should be until he found the Tamwa. And when he saw the people with, you know, bags on their head and tags around their necks, crawling on the floor in the dirt, trying to find food, they were eating from bowls like animals do. And, and he just said to his friend Heather Benoit, he said, I can't, I can't leave them like this. And he decided to stay, which is where, what he did and f until his murder in 1979. Theresa saying he wasn't practical man and at first no. he didn't really like no. it there. No, no, he, uh, yeah, I don't think uh, DIY came naturally to him, but he tried and uh, th then he realised to leave other people to do that sort of stuff. But actually what his gift was, was, was people and being with people and love and his spirituality and that's what he gave, gave them, he gave them hope. You met John? I did indeed, yes. I was probably eight or nine years old in the presence of my father and also of the late father John Dove. Um, I was there with my sister and we were visiting I think as I recall it was in Mazoe at the Acton's house but I did meet John again later at Silvira house and what struck me about him was that he took a particular interest in us as children. You know back in the day when uh, children accompanied their parents they weren't necessarily the center of attention and John made us feel like the center of attention so that was a very special memory for us on the first meeting and of course I met him again subsequently what age were you in my teens yeah what would you do what activities just make some time yes yes and I, I can remember one time my sister and I were sharing a a glass bottle from a glass bottle drinking coca-cola and he came up to us and said, I hope you enjoy your Coca-Cola. So from then on, <laughs> just a little special memory for children to keep, or teenagers to keep, that we um, uh, remembered him talking about Coca-Cola. So we call him, if he becomes a saint, he'll be the Coca-Cola saint to us. <laughs> he was kind of a, a countercultural uh, counter guy even before, long before Africa then. You know, children have seen and not heard. That was the kind of thing then maybe, yes. uh, but not for John. No. Uh, and I can, f yeah, he, there were no strangers in John's life. And, you know, we knew a lot of, a lot of the people who had a lot, to, um, a lot to do with him. Heather Benoit, for one, the late Heather Benoit, and uh, Paul and Anne Tinge from Zimbabwe. Uh, yes, I visited the, the uh, uh, Mutemwe Center, Leprosy Center, uh, after John's time there went a couple of times because my parents were involved in some way to do fundraising for the, uh, orphan, the, the um, orphanage up there. Which, uh, was that Matemwa? I don't think it was. Oh, I'm, not I, sure. I'm not quite sure what the relationship was to the colony, but we went there to visit as well. Oh, one other memory. John and the Bees. My mother used to, in, uh, she was a great lover of John Bradburn and she knew about his attraction to bees and how bees were attracted to him. And now and again she would say, if bees came in, she'd say, oh, John's just come to visit. You know? <laughs> so those memories, you know, the bees, the Coca-Cola, all those it's things that sort of help us to, excuse me, remember some of the... And did you follow pilot. his life, you know, from those early childhood memories, you, you then that kind of, you followed the interest, you followed his life throughout the headlines? The I did indeed. And of course, it was very sad on uh, September the 5th, 1979, although we didn't know on the day, we knew only a few days later that he had been killed in Motoko. And I was actually in the village of Motoko at that time. A very British saint on our hands, possibly, Matthew, would you say? Kind of, a, a kind of, is there a Lawrence of Arabia link there? He's kind of went out there. Kind of 
It's a challenge to say that because I knew him as, as a servant of Zimbabweans. So, yes, a British, I, I don't know what the combined word is, a Zimbrit, I don't know, <laughs> a British Zimbabwean saint or the other way around, yes. yes. My name is Sister Catherine. I used to be a pilgrim guide at John Bradburn Memorial Site in Zimbabwe. And before that, I knew him while he was living in Ganda Jufuba. He used to come to my aunt's house, eating our staple food. And I knew him at Silvera House as well. So when I was working at Mtema as a pilgrim guide, so many miracles happened while I was there. And so yes, he's a great person. And I vouch for his canonization of beatification. What were your first impressions of him the first time you met him? Is it not a common character? When I first met him, to be honest, uh, we young ones, because I was a young one at that time, we used to think he is mad because he was like uh, interacting with kids and animals and everything. So we thought this is a mad person, yet now we realize that we were wrong and we thank God for that. And uh, for me, is working with people at Mtema as a pilgrim guide that changed my mind because I, I realized a lot of things happening in, in the life of people because of praying through him. So, yes. Beneath, what, what was the madness? Uh, clowning around or he would say silly things or... Um, madness was not like saying things, but it was like you know, the way you could talk to animals <laughs> in Africa is not normal. So it, it was like we thought this man is mad as when you talk to even snakes or lizards. Because if he sees a, a snake, he wouldn't like people to kill it. He would just talk, tell it to move away, and it moved away. So. And he could talk to chickens as well, because they used to eat vegetables in the garden. But he told them to stop, and they stopped. <laughs> so couldn't you think that <laughs> the person is mad? But, well, you God. Uh, the people were not initially taken by John, is that fair to say? The people of Zimbabwe were a bit cautious about him. Uh, no, not that they, they were like him. Um, in that, on, in that time, when he was alive, to be honest, they thought he was... <laughs> I don't know what to say, but they thought he was someone who was ab <laughs> abnormal. <laughs> he won them over? He, but he won them over because of looking after the lepers. Because these lepers were like cast out of him. But when he started looking after them, everyone was, loved him. Even his killers loved him. I think they killed him because of jealousy, because they knew that he was a very good person and he, looking after lepers and protecting them. So I think that's the reason why. As the story goes, is it fair to say he could have lived? He, he did have the chance to live, but he wanted to stay with the lepers. Yes, yes. He wanted to stay because um, he was asked to move from Tema, but he, he wanted to stay there to protect them because he knew that if he went away, their lives were at risk. So. And do you think it's these actions that have made his legacy so strong in Zimbabwe? Not just that he was helpful, but he really went to the very end to help these people. Yes, yes he wanted to help them. And he, you, you can imagine that he, he went to death because he loved them. So that on its own showed people that he was a very good person and he, they changed their minds because of him. John's legacy is here to stay in Zimbabwe. Yes, yes. At the moment, like now, everyone knows that John Bradburn is 
a saint and see people go to Mutema. Give yeah. us an impression of his kind of how well known he, he wouldn't be so well known in England. Some people would have heard of him, some Catholics. But would he be a household name in Zimbabwe? Would everybody know that name at least? At the moment, I, I could say yes. Because uh, like when I was living in Mutema, people started coming a few, but they ended coming in thousands. So that means the, uh, the word is spread. So everyone knows that John Bradburn is a saint, yes. Thank you, sister. Well, I'm, I'm David Crystal, and I'm uh, academically a professor of linguistics, but in the context of John Bradburn, I've been editing his poetry, the enormous poetry database that he produced over the last two, I suppose, 20 years or so. Uh, the database is all now online, www.johnbradburnpoems.com, um, and he stands alone as the most prolific poet that the English language has ever had. And this is really surprising because most people have never heard of him, and yet he produced all this enormous poetic oeuvre over a period of, you know, some 20 or 30 years, and it was lost to sight. Nobody knew where it was or anything until it eventually emerged and no publisher could publish it, of course, because you can't publish 175,000 lines of poetry, but you can put it online. And that's what I've been doing over the last uh, 20 years or so. Where does your interest come in? Well, it was a pure coincidence, really. Uh, it was a friend of John Bradburn who showed me one of his poems, and I'd never seen anything quite like it before, because John was a poet who wrote in verse and, and could not write in prose. He writes letters home to his mother in verse, you what see. What does that mean to the layman? It means that here we've got somebody who's writing about somebody you can identify with, somebody who writes ordinary things about the weather, about his health, about his favourite food and drink, and all that sort of thing, uh, and relates it always to a spiritual perspective. There's always a spiritual background to this, but he starts off with an absolutely everyday kind of uh, issue, and then writes lovely poetry about it. I mean, that's the thing. Technically, it's very fine poetry for the most part. And so this is the difference. This is what makes John Bradburn different from uh, any any other poet, really. Uh, to take one silly example, uh, you know, many of us suffer from constipation. Uh, but no poet in the history of the language has ever written a poem about constipation. But John Bradburn has, you see. <laughs> That's the kind of th surprise you get when you read his stuff. And it's, um, it's because, he, as we know, his cause is coming up possibly for beatification and canonization. And you think, oh, a saint. Uh, I mean, who are the saints? And usually saints are priests and nuns and great spiritual people and so on. Here is an ordinary guy, you know, who did ordinary things and died for his faith, yes. But in his ordinariness, it's somebody we can identify with. And that's what makes his appeal, I think, to everybody. His interest for you has uh, maintained over the years. Yes, and the reason is, apart from anything else, that people keep discovering new poems. Uh, today, uh, somebody came up, I'll show you. Somebody came up with a new poem, a poem that nobody had ever seen before. Here it is. It's written in his handwriting. Uh, I had never seen this before. Uh, and this is what happens, you see, because John wrote verse poems. This is a lovely sonnet uh, written in classical verse. And he wrote this to everybody. You send, you send him a, a message, a little donation or a cake or something. He'd send you a poem back as a thank you. And this somebody here today, this is her mother, um, she kept this poem all over the years and wondered whether we had it in the database. No, we haven't. And this will happen again in a few months' time. And, and that's the excitement of it. I mean, imagine if we could find new Shakespeare poems every few weeks, <laughs> or Wordsworth poems. You can't do that. But with John Bradburn, stuff is appearing, and that's, the excitement continues, therefore. Do we see uh, in his life what it takes to make a poet? You know, Everyone, you know, people now are distracted. Yeah, so much sensory mm. excitement, the phone, yes. media. This is a guy who's a hermit and a serious hermit as well. Yes. And a jovial character. Yes. Uh, kind of put these two, two yes. seemingly opposite characteristics together. And a guy who is is 
a servant of service to the lepers. I mean, that's how he would describe himself, first and foremost. And so what do you do when you go out to a leper colony and you start to work with the lepers? I mean, of course, you look after them. He does one thing more. He writes a poem about every leper, gives them an identity, gives them a feeling of pride. I have a poem about me, you know, no leper has ever had that before. And so uh, this is the kind of uh, way in which his, his writing has that kind of un universal appeal. It, it goes beyond the circumstance of the moment into, you know, you and I could do that. You and I could do that. We could, we could write a poem about making a film, you know. Uh, poetry makes you see the, the ordinary world in a fresh light. That's what it does. And it takes that little bit of moment of reflection. Uh, you have to stand back from the world a little bit and look at it and say, I can write about that and I'm going to do it. Now, you don't have to be a brilliant rhymer or anything of that kind. You can just write in free verse uh, and, and yet get your insight down on paper. Everybody has got a poem inside them. If only they take the opportunity to let it, let it flow out. Do we see, I suppose, I mean, lots of saints have served the poor, maybe, uh, but not written so much poetry. Do we see other characters in, in John? Because he, uh, he had a great British education, I suppose, mm. and very reflective guy, and a sense of humour. Are they kind of three great ingredients for all this poetry, would you oh, say? Or is there, it there, there is, uh, he, his sense of humour is a very important element. Uh, he is one of the best punsters that the language has ever seen. He puns all the time. And he actually says, um, punning is great because God likes puns. You know, Mary likes puns. They, they like to laugh. God, God has a sense of humor. And he develops this theme quite, quite a lot. Um, and so it's almost impossible to find a poem where there isn't some kind of joke inside it. I, I mean, a, a serious joke, a, a, a kind of a joke that makes you think, "Ooh, you know, that, that's an uh, that's an interesting way of talking about whatever it is he's talking about." And so that that very characteristically British sense of humour is permeates the poetry. It really does. Many will say he's a man of self-deprecation. He does that all, all the time. Yes, I mean, mo m most greatly spiritual people are self-deprecating. Um, he is unbelievably so. Uh, he calls his poetry doggerel. Um, he says it's nonsense. He burns it. I mean, we have 175,000 lines of poetry. From all the evidence of the way he wrote, um, the, the actual amount he wrote was probably three or four times that. He writes in his letters, now is the time of year when I burn my rubbish. And he burns all the poetry he's written. Fortunately, he doesn't burn everything. And fortunately, the people he sent the poems to didn't burn them. And that's why we've got so much. But the actual amount he wrote, as he, as he says, it comes out of me like a tap. Many uh, English Catholic terminists will surely draw parallels with Cardinal Newman. Also yes. a kind of a real poet of other yes. sorts. Yes, there are, there are two poets that um, are frequently referred to in relation to Bradburn. One is, is uh, John Henry Newman and the other is Gerald Manley Hopkins. And both of them are, well, uh, in Newman's case, eventually Catholics, um, converts, uh, always suspicious of writing poetry until somebody says to them, you have an insight here. I mean, um, Hopkins is a case in point. He burns all his stuff because he thinks it's not proper uh, to go and be a priest and, and, and have poetry. And then when he, he does get into the, the system, the superiors say, you write some poems, you, know? <laughs> you write good poetry, write for us. And this links now back to, and people, literary critics have talked about this, links right back now to the great tradition of Catholic poetry, going right back to the metaphysical poets of the 17th century. People, uh, and not just Catholics, but others too, you know, people like John Donne and George Herbert and so on. Um, Bradburn read all these people. He was a great reader, and the influences of all these people are evident in his writing. A life cut short before its time, but uh, what was in, in many ways, and, you know, it just scares me, the thought that if he had been alive long enough for the computer world, how much would he have written then? Oh my, <laughs> he had a typewriter and that d doubled his output actually. Um, he became a poor typist, but it did double his output. But imagine if he'd had a word processor. Oh, 
get the feeling he may have just rejected it for some reason. I think he might, because he writes poems about rejecting television and, and all that sort of thing. You know, he wasn't very... I don't like the telephone, he says in a poem. I think he probably would have not liked the computer as well. He's a guy that today's times need. Yeah. Well, he, he is a poet for our times. Oh, and the other thing, you see, is he, he anticipates our times in many ways. He is, I think, the first poet to write a poem about the use of plastic and, and what a damage it is to everybody and how the birds are being harmed by it. This was in the 1970s. Well, who was writing poems about plastic or even talking about plastic in the 1970s? He was. He's a great ecological poet as much as being a spiritual one. And for him, of course, the two come together. I mean, ecology and spirituality, two sides of the same coin.